series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Several shots were fired as President Kennedy's motorcade passed through downtown Dallas. None of us will ever forget this day. Yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. This is just the thing, isn't it? Oh, you're going out of bounds. Welcome to the Hagman Daily Show, weekdays 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And now your hosts, Joe Hagman and John Robertson. Hello and welcome to this Friday, May 4th, 2018 edition of the Hagman Daily Show. Joe Hagman here, so glad to be here today. We've got so much to get into on this Friday edition. There is a lot going on in the news. Things we talked about yesterday and uh, throughout the week we are going to continue, continue to talk about that seem to be in the news constantly pertaining to the, the president and the witch hunt Robert Mueller investigation that just continues to spiral out of control. Uh, the latest story, newest Mueller prosecutor supported, donated to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. And we have seen what the uh, melee that Giuliani has created by some of the statements that he has issued in interviews with Fox News, Fox and Friends, Sean Hannity, and it is created really a firestorm, an illegal firestorm of people debating whether what President Trump did based on Giuliani's and others' stories and his own statements, if they contradict themselves and each other and what that would mean as far as a criminal prosecution when we see people uh, being, by the Robert Mueller probe, all being charged except for Manafort with process crimes like lying to the FBI or obstruction or whatnot, they could, from what I heard on uh, Alex Jones and Lionel last night in the fourth hour of InfoWars, basically Lionel said that what they could do is take Trump's own tweets and statements about Stormy Daniels and Cohen statements and put Trump uh, uh, that make Giuliani a, a witness against Trump based on his statements. And I think the takeaway from that was, you know, these people seem to talk a lot and they don't seem to control or, or uh, you know, have control of the narrative. But either way, uh, you know, we're talking about something that happened, what, in 2006? No, with the Stormy Daniels, there's no claims of wrongdoing. There's no abuse. There's no harassment. There's nothing here except an extramarital affair in his personal life 10 to 12 years ago. And then a payment for a non-disclosure agreement before the election. And so, so really, there's nothing here. I mean, this is standard practice for politicians and entertainers alike. Non-disclosure agreement, non non-disclosure agreements are very common, and it's just crazy that this whole. I mean, what the, what was the Robert Mueller probe intended to do when it was set out? Prove collusion between Vladimir Putin, Russia, and President Trump and his campaign. Since then, they've moved away from that to what? Obstruction of justice. First and foremost, based on the firing of FBI Director James Comey. Now, that is still a possibility that they could bring up. That's still on the table. But what could they charge Trump with pertaining to the Stormy Daniels controversy and Michael Cohen? This whole situation is so screwed up. And if Robert Mueller brings a charge against the president, then it's only related to Stormy Daniels, the non-disclosure agreement, the payment for that agreement. Is that enough for the American people to say, impeach, impeach? Is it enough for Congress to say, impeach? I just don't see it. And I know many others don't see it. One, one thing I do know is the president should never sit down for an interview with Robert Mueller. 
Looking at the Drudge Report, there is just a few headlines here pertaining to this investigation. Judge questions Mueller's power in Manafort case, accuses the Mueller team of lying, targeting the president, only interested in prosecutions or impeachment. So let's go over this a little bit. Federal judge accuses Mueller team of lying, tar- trying to target Trump, a con man. Here, let's listen to Mayor, what this right report says. Former New York City Mayor, the leader of the president's private legal team, Rudy Giuliani. Mr. Mayor, it's great to see you again. Always great to see you. Thank Maria. you so much for joining us. So th- explain what went on here. A lot of people feel like last night when you spoke with Hannity, it was a bombshell that you see. Yes, in <laughs> yeah. fact, the president did. Uh, pay this, and this has nothing to do with campaign finance. Explain. Well, it was only a bombshell in the sense that it blew up their case. I mean, the, this whole case began as a as a illegal campaign contribution. Hundred and thirty thousand dollars must have been campaign funds. Uh, they go after they they invade Cohen's office as a lawyer. Disgraceful. I do not know how they could put their their, their signatures on that affidavit, but they do. They invade it because of this issue about the hundred and thirty and a couple other things. And they don't bother to tell you, because they don't have any honor, that their whole case is falling apart. So I had, I, we want to get it out of the way. Uh, the money was paid by, by Michael Cohen in October of t- 2016. Of course he didn't talk to the presidential candidate then, because the man was, uh, wouldn't have even remembered. I wouldn't remember if you talked to me then. I was with him 24 hours a day. After it was over, there was um, the opportunity to reimburse, and the president reimbursed him out of non-campaign, non-campaign contribution money, private money, his money, and he did it over a course of 2017. But it was, it, it was mixed in with a couple of other things that have nothing to do with them or anybody else, just things that a lawyer would take care of for his client. You know, a lot of lawyers make out checks for their clients. Uh, for millions of dollars. This, and re- and remember, I don't want to say this in any kind of demeaning way, right. but $135,000 when he put a hundred million dollars in his campaign, it's hardly the biggest check that he wrote. <laughs> could, could, it, could it be that when the president was asked about this on the on Air Force One, and he said, "Look, I don't know. You're going to have to ask my lawyer. I don't know anything about it." He he didn't realize that they could actually tie it to campaign finance, and that would be uh, that that would be. That's a, a very a good crime. question, Maria, because this was never about the campaign. It's about personal reputation. The money wasn't paid to help the campaign or hurt the campaign. Well, the money a, was paid of because event. of the embarrassment in, in, an, in an allegation like this. Right. And people pay that kind of money even when it's not true. In fact, sometimes they pay it when it's not true even more than when it's true because they, they, it's so unfair. So, so the president had this one-night stand and then no, wanted he, to... No, he did not. He, he did not. He, he says no. She said no. She said no in a letter that they had a one-night stand. I... Uh, so then why did I he, pay? So then why did he pay the money? Because she was... Because, because uh, would Tom Brokaw have paid it? If he had kept his reputation? All right, let's stop there. Uh, I thought, I, I don't know, maybe the, uh, the uh, federal judge accuses Mueller's team of lying, trying to target Trump. If they're talking about the uh, a, a different judge, which I'm going to reference now, the federal judge expect expressed deep skepticism Friday in the bank fraud case brought by special counsel Robert Mueller's office against former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort at one point saying he believes that Mueller's motivation is to oust President Trump from office. Although Mueller's authority has been tested in court before, Friday's hearing was a notable uh, was notable for District Judge Ellis or T.S. Ellis decision to wade into the divisive political debate around the investigation. You don't really care about Mr. Manafort's bank fraud, Ellis said to prosecutor Michael Dearbean, at times losing his temper. Ellis said prosecutors were interested in Manafort because of his potential to provide material that would lead to President Trump's prosecution or impeachment, Ellis said. This is the judge. This is the district judge talking to the Robert Mueller team in a courtroom saying again you don't care about manafort's bank fraud you only care about material that will lead to trump's prosecution or impeachment this is what you're really interested in 
Ellis repeated his suspicion several times in the hour-long court hearing. He said he'll make a decision at a later date about whether Manafort's case can go forward. Wow. Further, we don't want anyone in this country with unfettered power. It's unlikely you're going to persuade me that special prosecutor has power to do anything he or she wants, the judge said. The American people feel pretty strongly that no one has unfretted power. When Dearbean, the prosecutor, answered Ellis' questions about how the investigation and its charges date back to before Trump campaign fraud, the judge shot back. None of that information has to do with information related to Russian government coordination in the campaign of Donald Trump. At one point, Ellis posed a hypothetical question, speaking as if he were the prosecutor, about why Mueller's office referred a criminal investigation about Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen, to New York authorities and kept the Manafort case in Virginia. They weren't interested in it because it didn't further our core effort to get Trump, Ellis said, mimicking a prosecutor in the case. Now, this is an amazing turn of events. I have not listened to this video. This is a video from CNN on what this judge said. It's a minute and 52 seconds. Let's listen to it. Let's start it. And let's see exactly what it is they are saying about this. In this hearing for this motion to dismiss, it turns out the federal judge in this case in the Eastern District a reprimand of sorts to the special counsel's team. Of course, this was all unfolding over the past hour. And what happened is this federal court judge, he was a Ronald Reagan appointee back in the 80s, but he said this to the special counsel when casting doubt over the special counsel's probe of Paul Manafort and all of the charges that have resulted against Paul Manafort. So he said this, he said, you don't really care about Mr. Manafort's bank fraud. And then the judge continued saying this was really a way for the special counsel to get at the president himself going forward, saying that you want to know what could provide and lead to Trump's prosecution or impeachment. That's what you're really interested in. You know, this is the first time we've heard a federal judge really kind of lash out and maybe slap the special counsel's team on the wrist here. You know, this is all emanating from many charges that Paul Manafort is now facing. He's facing dual indictments, one in Virginia, one in Washington, D.C. And what's interesting here is that this hearing today was all about this motion to dismiss. Paul Manafort's team said, look, the special counsel has been overreaching here. They had a mandate to look into potential meddling of the Russians in the 2016 election. And, and all of these uh, charges are really not even anything to do with the campaign. You can see Paul Manafort here leaving court. No doubt his legal team has to be feeling a little bit good after this federal court judge did reprimand the special counsel potentially for overreaching, saying that they're just going after Paul Manafort to get eventually at the president here. So, Kate, some very important and really what could All be right. monumental. So there you have it. That is uh, really, that's an awesome story. So the judge, again, T.S. Ellis, he has really is really going after uh, what it is Robert Mueller is doing and, you know, telling the truth of the matter, stripping the stripping this this whole dog and pony show down uh, to what it really is. And that is a an attack on President Trump because the people are sore losers that Hillary Clinton did not win her rigged election, even after she was allowed to uh, get away with so many crimes, specifically the emails, the classified server information, uh, classified information she had on her private server that she destroyed evidence and it was it's already a crime to have that evidence or that that uh, classified material and she definitely had it the server was in her own home bathroom she ran the state department and communicated those emails from the state department through the server in her bathroom but yet she didn't get in trouble and they set up they the corrupt people at the top of the FBI and DOJ under the Obama administration and everybody else that was part of his administration set up this process for investigations through uh, the attempt for the attempt of a coup against President Trump a legal coup to remove him from power I'd say that's the biggest scandal in American political history and it is 
amazing that nobody has gone to jail yet and that Trump and his team are the only ones that are being targeted. It's absolutely unbelievable. We'll come back to the Mueller case in a little bit when we, uh, if we have time later. I want to cover a few things that I found in the news that are interesting. I got a, a piece up on Hagman Report. It is titled, and I don't know if I like the title, um, this, but this is a fascinating story. Terrorist Bill Ayers says he served honorably against war even though he bombed the Pentagon. Bill Ayers, the man who launched President Obama's political career in his house, as well as headed the group called the Weather Underground, according to the FBI, Bill Ayers and his terrorist organization bombed several places, including the Pentagon and a police station in San Francisco. The report from the FBI goes on as following. On January 29, 1975, an explosion rocked the headquarters of the U.S. State Department in Washington, D.C. No one was hurt, but the damage was extensive, impacting 20 offices on three separate floors. Hours later, another bomb was found at a military induction center in Oakland, California, and safely detonated. A domestic terrorist group called the Weather Underground... <laughs> Whoop! sorry about that, claimed responsibility for both bombs, originally called the Weatherman or the, yeah, the Weatherman or the Weatherman, a name taken from an inline Bob Dylan song, and the Weather Underground was small, a violent offshoot of Students for Democratic Society, or SDS, a group created in the turbulent 60s to provide social change. When SDS collapsed in 1969, the Weather Underground stepped forward, inspired by communist ideologies and embracing violence, cr violent crime as a way to protest the Vietnam War, racism, and other left-wing aims. Our intention is to disrupt the empire, to incapacitate it, to put pressure on the cracks, claimed the group's 19... 74 manifesto by the next year the group had claimed credit for 25 bombings including the u.s capitol the pentagon the california general's attorney's office attorney general's office the a new york city police station you hear that a new york city police station so that's Bill Ayers. That, and also, uh, there was a bombing in San Francisco. Larry Grathwalt infiltrated. He was an FBI uh, a person who infiltrated the weather underground. And you can go on YouTube. I'll tell you what. Let's do this. Let's go on YouTube, and I'll play the clip for you. Uh, because this is something... We, we're, and there's a, we're going somewhere with this. There was a Twitter... Uh, I don't know what you call it, a Twitter fight about on May Day about Bill Ayers. And what he did was, uh, this is the headline from Twitchy, holy hell, Bill Ayers puts straight up insane spin on his terrorist career. And this is a Twitter fight. Some Twitter handle, agitator in chief, is celebrating the May Day communist protest that were going on in Chicago. So here are some of his tweets. Happy May Day from Chicago. Don't forget our history and those that fought before us. Thousands marching in the streets of Chicago for May Day, exclamation point. And what this, what we went over what May Day was, and it, it's a communist holiday. It's a communist day of cel celebration. Anyway, Larry Grathwalt. This is what Larry Grathwalt said about the weather underground. This is really good, so pay attention. Let me find the... Responsible then. Here we go. Up and after we... I brought up the subject of what's going to happen after we take over the government. Uh, you know, we, we become responsible then for administrating, you know, 250 million people. And there was no answers. No one had given any thought to economics. How are you going to clothe and feed these people? The only thing that I could get was that they expected that the Cubans and the North Vietnamese and the Chinese and the Russians would all want to occupy 
different portions of the United States. They also believed that their immediate responsibility would be to protect against what they called the counter-revolution. And uh, they felt that this counter-revolution could best be guarded against by creating and establishing re-education centers in the Southwest. Uh, where we would take all the people who needed to be re-educated into the new way of thinking and teach them how things were going to be. I ask, well, what is going to happen to those people that we can't re-educate, that are die-hard cap capitalists? And the reply was that they'd have to be eliminated. And when I pursued this further, they estimated that they would have to eliminate 25 million people in these re-education centers. And when I say eliminate, I mean kill 25 million people. I want you to imagine sitting in a room with 25 people, most of which have graduate degrees from Columbia and other well-known educational centers, and hear them figuring out the logistics for the elimination of 25 million people. And they were dead serious. That was from a 1982 documentary titled No Place to Hide. And we interviewed Larry Grathwall. We were friends with Larry Grathwall before his passing. He was on our show several times. And we talked about his infiltration of the Weather Underground. We talked about what it was that these people planned to do. So going back to the Post on Hagman report, terrorist Bill Ayers said he served honorably against war even though he bombed the pentagon that goes back there's at the bottom of that article uh the paragraph i wrote and then the fbi's uh assessment and information on the weather underground and what they had done there's a link to a, an article on twitchy.com bill Ayers uh, puts an insane spin on his terrorist career so there's a twitter battle going on and as i read to you earlier from a twitter handle agitator in chief uh, Bill Ayers got involved in the May Day uh, celebrations for communism in Chicago. And one person says, Bill, Bill Ayers came from a wealthy family that got him out of the draft. He was cool with attacking poor kids that got drafted, though. Bill Ayers replied, nope, loved the grunts, hate the war, and the politicians and their capitalist overlords willing to salute them for their own wealth and power. Then somebody else goes and says a few things uh, to Bill Ayers that I'm not going to read. And this is what Bill Ayers responded with. I served honorably in the struggle against war for peace and justice. Now, remember, this guy bombed police stations. He killed a policeman in San Francisco. Their organization did. He bombed the Pentagon. He went to trial and came out and said, guilty as hell and free as a bird. At when he walked out of the courtroom. One reply on Twitter here to him saying he served on, honestly is from Jordan at JJBUSC saying, nothing screams serving against war for peace quite like bombing the Pentagon, you lunatic. Another one in response to Bill Ayer's tweet, you're a piece of blank terrorist who helped kill and maim people. The fact that you didn't grow old and die in prison will re for, will forever remain a stain on America. And then more expletives that I'm not going to read. But back to the story on Hagman Report. So this guy is saying he served honorably against fighting the war machine while bombing several places. U.S. Capitol, the Pentagon, New York City Police Station and the San Francisco police station. He wanted to be in control of the government. He launched Barack Obama's political career in his living room. And Larry Grathwald tells us that their organization wanted to re-educate uh, tens of millions of people, but they at least 25 million people, and this was in the 70s, so it would probably be more like 50 to 70 million people today, that he want, they they were going to be exterminated because they could not be re-educated. So I just, uh, you know, it's not relevant really as far as uh, what 
Bill Ayer says today, but for him to go on Twitter and say he was a fighter, a good fighter and, and served honorably is such a joke. Uh, I just had to point that out. So let's move on. But uh, I thought I found that rather humorous. Now, I want back to President Trump and the Mueller investigation. I want to play a clip here from Fox News, uh, Fox Business. The harassment towards Trump is over the top. Now, this is Mike Huckabee. Uh, let's see what he has to say. Democrats, they're shying away from Nancy Pelosi's leadership. The Democrats aim to take back the House in November. Our next guest says, do not count on a blue wave winning in November. In other words, don't count on the Democrats actually taking back the House in November. Look who's here. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee. So why do you say, I mean, conventional wisdom, Governor, is that the Democrats, they're just going to walk right in there and take control again. Why do you say they're wrong? Well, first of all, there's nothing conventional about this era of politics. But let's ask ourselves, what's the Democrats' message? Elect us. We'll raise your taxes back up to where they used to be. We'll restore all the parts of Obamacare. Uh, we will also open our borders and fire a bunch of ICE agents and make it easier to slip in the border. Oh, and we'll go back to that foreign policy that gave us ISIS, the Iran deal, and that did nothing about Syria and North Korea. Now, does that sound like a winning message to you? If it does... You'll be voting to make Nancy Pelosi speaker again. <laughs> but has the message of growth and prosperity and better wages and more jobs, that's the other side of the coin. I don't think that message is necessarily getting through. You can't penetrate the media. Well, it's hard to get through to the media because all we're hearing is Russia, Russia, Russia. It sounds like sort of a uh, mess up of the uh, Brady Bunch, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. And that's what we hear every single day from the media, that it's all about Russia and collusion, even though there's no evidence of it. Uh, the harassment toward this president is just simply over the top. But there comes a point at which I think people are getting numb to it, getting sick of it, and they realize that even while the talking heads on most networks only talk about these peripheral issues, the truth is this is an administration that's getting things done that affect their lives. And when they talk around the kitchen table, they ain't talking Russia. They're talking about more money in their pockets and paychecks. And they're talking about a president who wants to build a wall and not let people in who are waving the flags of a foreign country in their face. You know, Governor, we had that NBC, they had to correct the wiretap story on President Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen. If you look at MSNBC or CNN, it's nonstop Stormy Daniels. That's all it is. Now, I said a little earlier in the program that if you try to take down this president on the basis of what may have been a white lie about an alleged affair 10 years ago before he got into politics, you try to take him down on that, and I think there will be hell to pay. Excuse my language, but I think that's the way it's going to be. What do you say? I totally agree with you, Stu. But, of course, I never disagree with you, Stu, so <laughs> what know? can I say? <laughs> Stop. But, you know, I sometimes think CNN is running really a, a parody of the Weather Channel because it's stormy, stormy, stormy. They might as well get Jim Cantore to come on <laughs> and hug uh, yeah. some type of light pole and talk about stormy. They've had her lawyer on more times than they have anybody from the administration. They, at some point, have to become embarrassed by their lack of practicing legitimate journalism. Okay, Governor. You think that the Republicans will keep control of the House and that the Democrats will not be successful in impeaching the president over a white lie? Yes, sir, we do agree. Thanks very much for joining us, Governor. Great stuff. We appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure, Steve. All right. Now, that was, um, you know, uh, covered a lot of stuff. But at the end there, again, what we talked about earlier, Stormy Daniels and this whole, th this whole Mueller investigation the special prosecutor's office is supposed to have an underlying crime when they start an investigation. They don't. They were that this whole thing was done by leaks. It was done by the Obama administration appointees from James Comey uh, to Loretta Lynch to Eric Holder to all these people. The unmasking, Susan Rice, the Peter Strauchs, the Lisa Pages, the Rod Rosensteins, the McCabe's all working together, conspiring together at the top levels of government and all the top uh, you know, executive uh, offices, the FBI, DOJ, the, you know, the ambassador to the UN, uh, the State Department, on and on and on, conspiring to create this false narrative, this Trump-Russia collusion, which is what they uh, intended to do. James Comey even said under oath, he, the reason he leaked the information is to get a special prosecutor appointed. 
moving from the Trump-Russia collusion. First it was Russian hacking, then Russian meddling, then it was Russian collusion, then it was obstruction of justice, then it was, you know, going after Paul Manafort and all them, and uh, George uh, General Flynn for a process crime, which we found out his 302, the interview sheet from the FBI, was doctored by Andrew McCabe, and they've had to delay his sentencing twice. I wonder if the reason that General Flynn's sentencing has been delayed twice is because of the information that's going to come out in the OIG report. We are expecting that report to drop in the next, I'd say, what, 10 to 12 days at the most. Some people are saying the end of May, but I I think mid-May was the point, is what, what they said that they were aiming for. Now, if that report comes out and it shows and, and there's two reports that they're they're coming out one is on the handling of the hillary clinton email investigation by the fbi and doj in 2016 there is a separate report coming out that is detailing the uh the the corruption or the crimes and and, and issues in the trump russia probe so we've moved so far from collusion with russia they drummed on for a year about that narrative. The mainstream media, hog wild and lunatic almost in their, well, not almost, it was. It was worse than that. In their, uh, you know, gotcha journalism trying to throw Trump under the bus. They had already convicted him in the eyes of the media, trying to make the public opinion shift in such a terrible way. But see, they haven't been able to shift the public's opinion. Trump's support has been strong his base has stuck with him and if you heard also in that clip with mike huckabee the 2018 midterm elections there is some interesting statistics coming out that show regardless of what happens in the house the right the republicans are looking to gain possibly nine seats in the senate which would give them an overwhelming majority and what is so fascinating about this is what I forget who was on the other night who said that you're going to have to vote along party lines because a vote for Democrats is a vote for impeachment. And I am not one to vote along party lines. I think it's it's bad, bad form. It's bad uh, as far as I mean, because you could be electing, you know, rhinos, you could be electing. Uh, all these you know, corrupt people, people who don't have the best interests. I mean, if there is a a Democrat who, you know, uh, maybe has some Democratic, lean, maybe, let's say a moderate Democrat, uh, and then you have some crazy uh, Republican who is a war hawk, uh, like a John McCain or, or someone like that, uh, you know, no, you don't have to vote along party lines. If your Democratic can- candidate uh, has publicly stated that they're not interested in in impeaching the president that they want to work with him to get things accomplished then you vote for the democrat in that situation but this is why it's so important that each and every person person leading up to these 2018 midterm elections and some primaries start very soon uh, the primary races for those elections start in may it's so important that we get involved and we get out there and we vote in the primaries because our we see this uh, weird thing in our country where Local elections get the least amount of votes. The state elections get, you know, the the local and state elections get the least amount of votes. The things like the midterms get higher than the local and state elections uh, attention. Then the president elect the presidential election gets the most uh, attention. And if we were to do that in the opposite way, giving the local the most attention, we could make a difference we could change things from the bottom up and again we've been talking about this for weeks now but that what that's what has to happen we have to figure out a model and get people on board from every city every county every state to get on board to to make this happen from the people who are going to run for those positions of power to the people who are going to help them organize their campaign and support them as they continue so we're working on, I mean, we haven't sat that and put pen to paper yet, but this is something that I'm very passionate about, that we see the organization on the left that is so 
it seems very organized. You know, a George Soros snaps his fingers and, and throws some money around, and, and you have Antifa protests in, in ten cities across America. It's um, it, and we don't have that kind of organization on the right, but we do have the truth. We do have the morality, and we do have the Lord on our side if we are obeying him and, and asking that he lead us in all things. So, you, I mean, really, we should be able to make a huge difference in this country. We just need to figure out where and how we can do that. Now, John is going to be joining me in just a second. He had some stuff he had to take care of. That's why he has not been on the show, uh, but he'll be joining us throughout pretty much the second half of the show. And I want to get into this. Well, maybe I should wait because he's going to want to talk about this. Uh, the, the Mandalay Bay shooting body camera footage released. And there's a, a headline on Zero Hedge. It's also up on Hagman Report. No broken windows reported. Now, this seems to, if we take this at face value, this obviously goes against the narrative that Stephen Paddock carried out the attack from the 32nd floor on the Mandalay Bay. But we did see pictures with broken windows, and there was a video, I remember, of witnesses saying that glass was falling from the Mandalay Bay. Interestingly enough, that video, you can hear the last two shots, both single shots, about 10 seconds apart. Almost like if it was him killing himself, he tried, pulled the trigger, and missed or got scared, and then tried again and was successful. Or somebody else was in the room. Many people think in those photographs of him laying dead on the floor that it shows a bullet wound to the chest. I did see the spot. I don't know if that was an actual wound or blood from the initial. Uh, you know, he could have had his head down when he pulled the trigger and, and blood fell on his shirt. But either way, it was suspicious, especially since it looked as though there could have been two bullet holes in him and at that video there were two single shots and those were the last two shots that came out of that room so it is a very interesting story but when john comes on we'll get into that more and we will look at what uh you know if anything this adds to the mystery of what happened in las vegas now the second amendment we saw so many kids after the parkland shooting and the, the left, we were talking about the left organization. After, remember the uh, March for Our Lives, how the entertainment industry and the David Hoggs of the world got together, were able to raise millions of dollars and had this march in D.C. where hundreds of thousands of people showed up, that kind of organization. Well, that's because they have the help of the media. They have the help and the money backing of these liberal lunatics. Now, we have something very unique and organic that's going on a student walkout in support of the second amendment the stand for the second event was launched in response to student-led walkouts in march to show that not all students agree more gun laws are the answer to protect schools wrote cbs's christopher brito the march against gun violence involves students at thousands of schools from coast to coast. Wednesday, events were more modest in size, but still passionate. All right, I just got a, a message from John here. We were supposed to bring on guest Mike Gendron. Okay, uh, and he is not connected with me on Skype. But what I'm going to do with the information John just sent me is connect with him. Uh, so just bear with me for a moment. I know this is uh, this is kind of weird, but I got to type this in and get him connected. And he's going to come on and talk about some similarities and, and disturbing things that he's been noticing about Catholicism and Islam overlapping. And this should be very interesting to, um, let's see, okay, here we go. I found him on Skype. This should be a very interesting uh, topic, and I want to hear what he has to say. Uh, so I'm going to connect with him on Skype, and we're going to bring him on. 
so I'm going to send this to him now. And we're going to bring John on too. So, uh, all right. Sorry for all that. We got 20 minutes left in the show. So we're going to give that specifically to Mike Gendron. And I am going to uh, see if John is available. Because if he is, yep. We'll bring him on first, then we'll bring on Mike, and then we should be good to go. A uh, very interesting topic that Mike wants to talk about. And uh, John had some weird issues going on, so he uh, couldn't join us at the beginning of the show. And Mike Gendron was supposed to come on, and he uh, was getting his contact information to John, and John wasn't able to get it to me, so I could not bring him on. Um, so we it looks like we have Mike Gendron here ready to go. So I'm going to call him. Sorry, I know the uh, ringing tone on the uh, on air is uh, hard, but just bear with me. And uh, folks, we have with us Mike Gendron, and it's so great to have him on. And and Mike, I apologize. We got about 18 minutes of the show left, and I want you to uh, come on and talk about it, the uh, what what you and John spoke about the. Catholicism in Islam. Welcome to the Hagman Daily Show. Yeah, well, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. Yes, um, we want to talk about the convergence of Islam and Roman Catholicism. This was a message that I recently gave, and I also wrote an article in my monthly e-newsletter that goes out to 40,000 people. So any questions you have pertaining to that, it's really amazing the common bonds that we see between Islam and Roman Catholicism. I think one of the most interesting common bonds would be as we look at end-time prophecy, we know that there'll be lying signs and wonders that will deceive the world, and Satan will be trying to rebuild his religious tower of Babel again. And so I think it's interesting to note that the apparitions of Mary have been increasing with more and more frequency throughout the world. The Bible tells us in Second Thessalonians about the coming deception in the world. He said, um, Paul wrote, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And so what we see happening today are apparitions of Mary appearing in more and more places throughout the world. But probably the most intriguing place is Fatima, Portugal, a city named after Mohammed's first daughter. And Muslims are now flocking to these apparition sites to get a message from Mary. And it's really interesting to hear some of the messages. One of them recently said, Muslims, Orthodox, and Catholics are all equal before my son and I. You are all my children. I am giving you a piece of heaven. She is said to be coming for all of her children. So I think this will be one of the major catalysts to bring unity between Islam and Roman Catholicism. Together, these two religions make up about 40% of the world's population. So it's really intriguing to see what's happening before our eyes. You know, it is amazing. And uh, there, are, there is a lot of talk that Roman that Islam was started by, I guess you'd call the secret societies of the Vatican. But the uh, just some of the things that we see, just imagine, as you said, the unity that we would see between Islam and the Catholicism, it, it, it almost seems like a, a match made in heaven because, and I'm not talking about the individual Catholic believers out there. I'm talking about the hierarchy uh, leadership in the Catholic church as the, uh, if many Catholics would come out of that system, if that merger ever took place, I really do believe a majority would, but the Catholic religion, I, I heard an interesting thing the other day about Syria, when we hear about Syria in the Middle East, some of these Middle East Christian nations, that many of that, those Christians are actually Catholics, which surprised me. And uh, it's just, when we well, see... Well, it's interesting, how... Joe, excuse me, but uh, just this just broke today in the news. Saudi Arabia has actually inked a deal with the Vatican to build Christian churches in Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you wow, no. heard about that today, but currently Saudi Arabia is the only country in the region without a single Christian church. And of course, I put Christian in parentheses because Roman Catholicism is not Christian. But anyway, for Saudi Arabia now to sign an agreement with the Vatican to build churches, this is huge. 
because is. once again we see the Vatican building bridges into Islam so that the two religions can come together. It's fascinating. We're seeing a rebuilding of the religious tower of Babel. You mentioned secret societies. Well, there was a Jesuit priest that attended one of the gatherings of Muslims and Catholics at an apparition site. And this is a quote. He said, the religion of the future will be a general converging of religions in a universal Christ that will satisfy all. The other religions in the world are part of God's plan for humanity. And then he said, God's kingdom permits this, and it is nothing more than a diversified sharing in the same mystery of salvation. So, Joe, can you see how doctrinal truth is being suppressed for the sake of unity? There's nothing that's going to stop this pope from moving the ecumenical agenda forward at a very rapid pace. And he, more than ever, has been building bridges into Islam. A lot of people don't realize it, but the Vatican actually issued a statement back in 1994. It was entitled, Spiritual Bonds Which Unite Us, and that's 16 Years of Christian-Muslim Dialogue. So that was 1994, and ever since then, we've been seeing Muslims and Roman Catholics look together for common bonds of unity. Yeah, there, there's a report here from 2016, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, no, September 8th, 2016, Time for Catholics to Reconsider Islam and the Prophet Muhammad from CatholicWorldReport.com. In recent months, prominent Catholics have taken pains to emphasize the special ties between Islam and Catholicism. And it goes on from there it, it, to point out the similarities that say, it, like, Christ, here's an example, Christian and Islam, Christianity and Islam share a commitment to love and respect for the life, dignity, and welfare of all members of the human community. We hold common con commitment to peaceful coexistence and mutual respect, which is just insanity because we know Islam is a uh, religious political system of con military conquest. Yeah, of course. In fact, both religions, Catholicism and Islam, have a similar political ideology. They both employ autocratic religious systems to control people. You know, the primary growth for both religions is through birth. And then once you're born into the religion, then you're held captive by fear. In the Catholic Church, there's great fear if you ever leave the Catholic Church they say that you will burn in hell, and if you leave the Islamic religion, then you are threatened with death. And so they, held, they hold people by captivity through fear. I want to share, too, that the Catholic Catechism, I don't know if you're aware of this, Joe, but the 1994 Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is the official authority of the Catholic religion, in paragraph 841, it says, the plan of salvation also includes the Muslims. Together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. And so you can see the Catholic Church building these bridges into the Islamic religion. And uh, it's fascinating to include them out of all the religions in the world as part of their plan of salvation. It's absolutely mind boggling. And, you know, one thing that surprises me is when you say, you know, it it keeps people with a with a, a spirit of fear we're saying that you'll go to hell if you leave the catholic religion i was raised in both the presbyterian but mostly a catholic church baptized in a catholic church went to catholic school until eighth grade was confirmed as a catholic and when i I'm, i was not uh, i believed in jesus back then but I was not a, you know, I, I didn't read the Bible. I wasn't serious. But I knew enough that to know that the Catholic Church was a bunch of BS and that this was not the church. That, and so I went to where my mother goes, which was a Presbyterian church, and that was much better. I did not like the real uh, ritualistic nature of the Catholic Church, and I didn't like... Uh, it just did not it was the religious element that really bothered me and i since left the presbyterian church that i got married in uh, because they started accepting homosexual clergy in marriage but uh anyway the we seen the vatican make crazy statements like if aliens are real we'll we'll baptize them and, and they can become part of the church 
It's no, from the World Council of Churches and this New World Order globalist agenda incorporates these two religious systems, Catholicism and Islam, it will jump merge them into one and they will become, you know, the actual moral authority in the world over other religious institutions. And this is where we can see the end times, how the persecutions of Christians, true Christians, could uh, occur through mergers like this. Well, you're absolutely right, Joe. In fact, we know that the uh, religion of Antichrist will also be a religion of fear, that people will be forced to convert, otherwise they will be threatened with death. And so this is just but a precursor to the autocratic rule of Antichrist. But it's interesting you talk about your experience as a Catholic. The, a lot of people don't realize that the Catholic Church embraces a counterfeit Jesus. And so both religions have a Jesus, but they're both counterfeit. They're both another Jesus. The Apostle Paul warned that someday people would come and preach another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel, and, and then he ends with, you put up with this. And, and that's where we are today. We have born-again Christians that are putting up with a false Christ in both religions. Catholicism denies that Jesus is sufficient to save them completely and forever, and Islam has a counterfeit Christ, which is called Isa. And he did not die on a cross, and he is not God. And so my heart and my compassion is to reach this huge mission field with the true Jesus and the true gospel. And that's why we have so many resources available. And I would invite your listeners to visit our website, proclaimingthegospel.org. We have a DVD entitled The Coming One World Religion. And Joe, everything you and I are talking about now is actually recorded in this message. And a lot of people know that the end time prophecy speaks of a world religion that will worship a false Christ. And we're right in that stage right now where people are lifting up a counterfeit Christ. And that is the generic Christ that is drawing all people together. So I encourage people to take advantage of our evangelistic resources and rec recognize that these two religions make up nearly 3 billion precious souls that need to hear the gospel. And that's what we're all about, is to equip and encourage the saints to reach out to this huge mission field made up of Catholics and Muslims. Yeah, and again, proclaimingthegospel.org is a great tool. They have so many, so much, so many resources there that uh, you can uh, find and use. And uh, I would go there under equip. You, there's a drop down menu, and they have not only the articles, the the important information, but they also have you can get the newsletter. They have videos, they have uh, audio, and other uh, references such as eBooks, and it's a great one stop shop to get all the information that you need when we're talking about these religious systems that are different from Christianity, as you said, preaching another Jesus, a separate Jesus that the Bible warns us about. And there are several other references in the Bible that uh, indicate that the Catholic Church and some of their practices are not what or not the Christian way, you know, forbidding to marry and, and abstaining from meats and, and whatnot. And there's many others. But the real threat is the merger of Islam and Catholicism and this new world order religion. Um, Mike, real quick, what do you think has to happen for this merger to happen? Would we have to have like a military conflict, a World War Three type thing? Or do you think that this can just gradually uh, or just happen with some sort of agreement? Well, I really believe it's going to be an apparition of Mary that comes on the scene and calls for unity between Islam and Catholicism. We've already seen some of her, some of her messages are calling for all of her children. In fact, uh, it's really interesting that one of her messages said that the only thing you need in order to get to heaven is to be a good person. Both religions speak of a works, righteousness, salvation. And so they already have that common bond. And that's what the religion of Antichrist will be. It's a works, righteousness, salvation. So I really believe that it's going to be a lying sign and wonder of Satan appearing as an apparition of Mary that will call for unity. And he may even say that Mary is um, highly esteemed among Muslims, and you need to recognize that Allah has sent her so that there can be unity with Catholics and Muslims. And I think that will happen 
quicker more than uh, than later because I think we're in that season. I also wanted to just tell your listeners the 10 common bonds that I shared at a conference and in my newsletter. You can go to our website and see the common bonds in my May newsletter. And it's fascinating to see. Both of them are anti-Semitic, which I think is also a common bond that will bring these two religions together, unity over a common foe, and that is the Jewish religion. So um, encourage your listeners then to be faithful to the Great Commission, to recognize we're in the end times. The only hope people have is if they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ presented in all of its purity and all of its exclusivity. Yeah, and we need... Everybody needs to be disciplined and know their Bible. Uh, we, one of the biggest ways that the these false doctrines, these false teachings, and teachers are able to prosper by twisting Scripture and you know changing the true meaning of what uh, the Gospels say is by uh, people. The, the main reason it is allowed to flourish is because people don't know their Scripture. If they knew their Scripture, mm -hmm. they would not be deceived by all these false teachers. They would have the discernment to be able to recognize where these uh, people are going wrong in their messages. And it's so unfortunate and sad to see that most, you know, I'd say half of people who proclaim that they are Christian don't ever read the Bible. Maybe oh, Joe, that is right on. In fact, if I can just share in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32, Jesus was speaking to the apostate Jewish leaders, and he said, a true disciple of mine is one who will abide in my word, then they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. And so the only hope for these people that are trapped in religious deception is to give them the truth of God's word. And we are called to sow the seed, the imperishable seed of God's word, because in that seed, life will come forth to those who are dead in their sin. And so you're right. We need to encourage people to get into the scripture, to know the word of God, and then share it with those who are deceived. Amen. Uh, Mike Gendron is our guest, and his website, CatholicWorldReport.com. No, not CatholicWorldReport.com. I'm sorry. ProclaimTheGospel.org. I had the wrong. I was looking at the wrong website. There was a picture of the Pope on the one I was looking at. Uh, proclaim, yeah, don't send them there. ProclaimingTheGospel.org. Yes, thank you. ProclaimingTheGospel.org. Mike, if your schedule allows, uh, would we be able to, to do a part two maybe on Monday or Tuesday next week from 1230 to 1? Since we're already connected on Skype, uh, we can uh, make sure it's, it's done and, and we'll be there on time and everything. Uh, if your schedule is available, if not, we can set it up for a later date. But I'd love to continue this conversation. Yeah, Joe, I could do it on Monday. I'm already committed on Tuesday, but I really believe in what you're doing, getting the word out, encouraging people to abide in God's word and also to reach out to those who are perishing. There's nothing more important in this life than where will we spend eternity. And I just hate to see people so deceived that they will not even open the Bible to know the truth about their salvation. When the Lord saved me, there was two things that came to my mind very quickly. The only thing in this world that will last for all eternity are the souls of men and the Word of God. And I wanted to invest my life in those two things that would last for all eternity. And I encourage others to do that as well. This Absolutely. life is but a vapor and soon will be gone. And the only thing that will last the souls of men and the Word of God. And that's right. And it's uh, this is why we need to not only pray uh, each and every day for ourselves, but I always pray that anybody who it's possible to be saved finds the Lord and, and gets saved because, you know, we don't want to see anybody perish in hell. And so many people have strayed away from the faith today. It is uh, a, tra a true tragedy. And it's what the Bible says will happen in these times, the apostasy, the falling away from the church and also the truth. That's the uh, outro music that's playing. So we are out of time. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. It was a, a great week and we will be back Monday uh, with Mike Gendron on the second half of the show. So make sure you tune in where we're going to pick up right where we left off in this great conversation. We will be back on the Hagman Report tonight, 7 to 10. Go to HagmanReport.com, bookmark the site, check out all the articles there. And if you are interested to talk more about what I said about Bill Ayers, go to the comments section on the article. All right, have a great night.
The Hagman Daily Show is brought to you by The Hagman Report. Tune in to The Hagman Report weekdays, 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information, go to HagmanReport.com. That's HagmanReport.com.